have a visual notification that we are streaming on YouTube. Yep. And whom should I make host now? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay, I'm going to go dark and silent. I will keep you guys at full volume so I can hear you. If you need anything, sing out and um, enjoy your meeting. And I am available as needed. Okay. And thank you, David. I will do the same. And if Elizabeth, you could just, yep, thank you. Daughter, Daughter's on it. Hi, everyone. Hi, we're going to get started soon. We're just waiting for everybody to come on. So I'm also in a... Um, House committee hearing, so I may be muted at some point when you're looking for me, but that shouldn't take long. It's about to go to vote. It's okay. in comment right now.
Hi everyone, we're gonna get started soon. We're just waiting for everybody to come on. Charlotte, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, friendly reminder to record when it's time. Yes, I will. Thank you. Elizabeth, I'm going to stop sharing because I just got that PowerPoint. So I want to get it on my desktop and then I'll be back to sharing. Sounds good. And your screen share is appropriate and proper. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Beverly, I think if you want, we can get started now. Okay, sounds good. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Commonwealth Agents Council on Aging meeting today. Um, and I'm we have a great deal to cover the agenda, so we're going to need to very, be very cautious and dil diligent and conscious of the time. So at this time, Charlotte will go over the housekeeping instructions. Thank you, Beverly. Um, due to the active state of emergency and the COVID-19 pandemic, this is an electronic meeting pursuant to item 4-0.01 of the 2020 Appropriation Act. Meeting notice has been provided. The meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken. All votes will be conducted via a roll call of voting members. Meeting materials are posted under the Council on Aging's webpage at the link posted on the slide. Members of the public are able to live stream this meeting via the DARS YouTube page.
Please be advised that if the live stream is interrupted, we will need to pause the meeting until it is restored. Public comment will be accepted by email or phone to my attention. Public comments that were received by January 25th will be read or if lengthy summarized during the meeting when we reach that agenda item. There is a FOIA form for public comment on the IT components of this meeting. If you would like that form, you can email me and I will send it to you. Working through the Zoom functions, members, please keep your microphone on mute unless you are speaking. This helps reduce background noise. Also, before you speak, please state your name. Not only does this help your colleagues on the council know who's talking, but it also helps Cecily with documenting the minutes. Um, Beverly, if you could help me remind members of this as we go through the meeting, I would appreciate it. Um, it also helps um, as we are discussing recommendations and for the captioner as she tries to ca capture the ca uh, real-time discussion. If you have your video enabled, please be aware that the system may capture your image and video in the public streaming and in the recording. You can use the chat feature um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That is being monitored by my coworker, Elizabeth, and do the degree feasible me. If you would like to view the real-time captioning of today's meeting, please click on the CC button on the menu bar at the bottom and select show subtitles. Zoom participants will have to turn their closed captioning on. The YouTube streaming will automatically include the captioning. Um, view options are in this area and you can set them yourself or some features will be set by the host. And lastly, I'd like to thank the DARS video teleconferencing team and the DARS communication team for making this electronic meeting possible. Beverly, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Charlotte. And again, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's meeting. And as Charlotte mentioned, we have a lot to accomplish during today's meeting. And as we through, move through the items, uh, some are more straightforward than others. And I'm going to ask that members consider ways to keep the business flowing and allow more time for our important presentation today. I'm confident that the presentation will bring some questions and possible discussion. So please help us all be mindful of the clock. So in the interest of time and with recognition that the council does not have any new members for today's meeting, I'm gonna ask Charlotte to please and board staff to conduct a simple roll call for the council members to let us know if a quorum is present for today's meeting. So when your name is called, please indicate your presence. Charlotte. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order. Last name, David Broder. Here. Harvey Chambers. Present. Uh, Deborah Davidson will not be with us today. Uh, Jennifer DeSano. I'm here. Thank you. Amy Duncan. I'm here. Joni Goldwasser. Here. Carter Harrison. Here. Carla Hesseltine. Carla, I see you, but I think you're muted. I'm sorry, here. Okay. Tressor Lynn Kelly. Diana Padawa. Here. Debbie Preston. Here. Catherine Reed. I'm here. Tina Savla. Here. Beverly Sobel's here. here. Mm -hmm. Michael Wampler. Here. Jay White. Here. Roland Winston. Here. Erica Wood. Here. And for our ex officio members, uh, Commissioner Hayfield. I'm here. 
Kara Ragland. Deborah Silverman. Here. And Terry Smith. I'm here. Great. Beverly, you have a quorum for today's meeting. Thanks, Charlotte. And um, I'm gonna... go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'd also would like to announce some other JAR staff we have with us today. We have Marcia Dubois, um, David McKenzie, Betsy McElfresh, Elizabeth Pataka, and Cecily Slazer. Thank you, Charlotte. And I wanted to take a minute to share that this today is Deborah Silverman's last meeting as the V4A representative and Thelma Watson as the new V4A past president will be moving into that position as representation representative. So while we look forward to having Thelma join us, I'd like to extend a gratitude to Deborah for her commitment and service to the Council on Aging over the last few years. So without any further, just let's go ahead and get with the meet, meeting. Um, we Thank have, you so much, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So at this time, we need to approve the agenda and I'd like to hear a motion to approve it. Is there a motion? Carter, I move to approve the Mrs. It's just a quick reminder to announce your name so that we can capture that in the in the minutes. So there's a second to the motion. Catherine, we have a second. Okay, thanks. Um, who was the first? Who made the who made the motion first? Carter. Carter. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Not hearing any, Charlotte, please conduct the roll. Okay. Um, David? Aye. Harvey? Harvey, you might be muted. Aye. Got it. Um, Jennifer? Aye. Amy? Aye. Joni? Aye. Carter? Aye. Carla? Aye. Diana? Aye. Debbie? Aye. Catherine Reed? Aye. Tina? Aye. Beverly? Yeah, here. Michael? Aye. Jay? Aye. Roland. Roland, you might be muted or in his meeting. Erica. Aye. Okay. Um, Beverly, or the motion passes. Thank you. So at this time, we are going to review the previous minutes and I'd like to ask Joni Walgat Goldwasser to please present the minutes from the September meeting. Thank you, Beverly. This is Joni and the September meeting minutes have been provided to members in the meeting announcement with all the attachments and also for the public. They're also posted on the council's webpage. Um, are there any corrections to the September 16th, 2020 meeting minutes? This is Catherine Reed. I move to approve. Is there a second? This is Amy okay. Duncan, and I will second that. Okay. There has been a motion to approve the September meeting minutes along with the second. And any further discussion? Okay, I Charlotte, could we please conduct a roll call for the vote? Yes. Before I do that, I just also want to share that Kathy Miller with DARS is also joining us today. Okay, so this is a roll call for the approval of the September meeting minutes. David? Aye. Harvey? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. 
Amy? Aye. Joni? Aye. Carter? Aye. Carla? Aye. Uh, Diana? Aye. Debbie? Aye. Catherine? Aye. Tina? Aye. Beverly? Aye. Michael? Aye. Jay? Aye. Roland? Aye. Erica? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is the public comment period. And I'd like to announce that public comments were accepted by email or phone and received by January 25th. And any that we received will be read now. During, and so I'd ask Charlotte to please review any comments that we received. Thank you, Beverly. Yes, the council did receive two public comments. The public comments submitted by Michael Martin were emailed to council members and included on the council's SharePoint page with the meeting materials. In the interest of time for today's presentation and which relates to this public comment topic, I will offer a brief summary of the public comment now. Uh, Michael Martin, public comments will also be included in the draft minutes for today's meetings. In his public comments, Michael Martin has said he outlined st statistics on the impacts of COVID-19 on older adult adults, including rates for hospitalizations and death, expressed concerns about the vaccine prioritization in Virginia as it impacts older adults, shared examples of how other countries and states are accounting for older adults in vaccine prioritization, put forward a recommendation that Virginia consider the inclusion of older adults, including those 65 to 74 in vaccine prioritization and rollout, and a recommendation that Virginia consider a sub-priority within phase 1B, which is a large group and that sub-priority would be older adults and adults with underlying health conditions. And lastly, he shared an article on the rollout of the vaccines in long-term care facilities. Uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Martin for the public comments. And as staff mentioned, mentioned we do have a related presentation today. And I hope that you're able to view this meeting on the YouTube to page, and we really appreciate the info what you're sharing what's sharing with us. Um, so, if members would like to further discuss these comments, please save them for later in the pre. Since we're going to have a presentation on this exact subject, and we at that time will spend the time discussing it. So, with that in mind, I mind I'd like to call on Catherine Hayfield, Commissioner to present a DARS agency update. Catherine. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, it's great to be with you all today. I'm Kathy Hayfield, the commissioner of DARS and an ex officio member of this council. And um, I will keep my comments short because I know you have a full agenda, but I, I definitely wanted to be here today and to thank you for your good work, your good and important work with this council. Uh, we all know now more than ever the um, importance of strong services for older adults in Virginia as the COVID-19 disproportionately has impacted this group of individuals. I believe that you all are aware of the numbers, but I'll run through them just for a minute. This past weekend, Virginia surpassed 468,000 people with um, COVID-19 cases. And unfortunately, individuals over 60, and this is responding to Mr. Martin's um, public comments, make up approximately 20% of cases but they make up 90% of the deaths associated with COVID-19. 
And there have been more than 2,900 deaths in long-term care facilities in Virginia. The um, Commonwealth has worked to prioritize individuals to be vaccinated in nursing homes. And um, I know you're going to have a presentation on this area, but the governor did also change the original guidelines so that people 65 and older and those under 65 with underlying medical conditions are now also in 1B. And that is in some parts of the state, um, the area that um, where vaccines are available now. Um, these numbers are devastating and it does point to the absolutely critical work that's being done by many of you in the roles you have, as well as the organizations with whom we work, the Area Agencies on Aging, um, our um, very, very important ombudsman these, at this time. And I appreciate the time you're taking today to focus on the needs of older Virginians. The, there has been a long-term care task force that our um, folks have been very involved in, especially the ombudsman. And we really feel that this is a critical area in the Commonwealth that needs to continue beyond the COVID-19 period. And the very sad thing is that COVID-19 has brought the needs of older Virginians to the forefront. And it's critical that after we get through this pandemic, that we keep the pressure on to assure that services are improved so that at the time that maybe this would happen again, let's hope we don't see that in our lifetimes, but that we're better prepared and that older Virginians and Americans are not so disproportionately impacted as they've been this time. I want to thank um, the Area Agencies on Aging for being at the front lines of this pandemic and doing really amazing heroic work, working with individuals in their communities so that they do not end up in long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities. We were able to work with the Department of Health ourselves, DARS, to assure that employees working on the front lines through area agencies on aging are in that prioritization category 1A. And that has been helpful in very recent time, getting those staff um, pulled forward when that had been a problem previously. Um, the, as you all know, the General Assembly is in session. And um, I'm sure that Erica and your legislative committee will be giving you an update. And um, I'd be very happy to hear any advice or input or advocacy that you would be asking the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services to do um, over the next few weeks. If there are areas that you're looking for extra support, please let us know during this meeting. I think I'll stop there um, because I, it, Charlotte or Beverly, is Marsha Dubois speaking today? She's supposed to following your presentation. Okay, then I'm sure she will, she will cover some of the details of things going on in the agency. Do you all have any questions for me today? Okay, all right, well, thank you for having me and Thank you for your advocacy and support of um, older Virginians. It's, it's so very, very critical today. And we thank you for being part of our meeting today. Right. So now um, we're gonna hear from the Deputy Commissioner, Marsha Dewar with any updates that she has from the Division for Community Living. Marsha. Well, well, thank you, Bev. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I too will try to, to make this brief because I know you have a really packed, um, important agenda. Uh, and, and I will start off with um, giving an update on um, the COVID relief funds uh, that were pa passed in December, but have not been allocated to the states yet. Um, and uh, 
uh, as you all know, um, Charlotte has already sent out um, uh, really comprehensive uh, notes to you all. Uh, so I'm just gonna touch on some highlights here for you. And again, these are, these are national figures that I'm going to read because we don't know exactly what Virginia's allocations will be yet. Um, so in terms of increases for aging and disability services, um, nationally, we know that um, in this most recent COVID relief uh, bill, there were an additional 5 million for Older Americans Act Title III congregate meals and 10 million increase for home delivered meals, 2 million for home and community-based supported services, 3 million for the National Family Caregiver Support Cro Program, as well as 400,000 in new funding for the RAISE Family Caregivers Act Advisory Council, 2 million in grants to states to address guardianship laws and procedures, and 60 million increase to Section 202 supported housing for the elderly, and a 20 million increase in Section 811 housing program for people with disabilities. Other funding, there was another um, appropriation of 175 million for OAA, Older Americans Act nutrition programs. Um, most of that will go to Title III programs for area agencies on aging with 7 million of that going to um, Title VI, which are Native American um, programs. Um, there was an extension on the flexibilities given um, to Older Americans Act nutrition programs. This is really great uh, because those flexibilities allow for um, some of the services uh, to be um, made much more flexible during the pandemic. Um, and that's allowed for our area agencies on aging to be able to um, shift, for example, from senior centers to home delivered meals. And um, so that's, that's really um, good that that's been extended. Um, one item of note, um, there was an additional 100 million for elder justice activities but for the first time, 50 million of that was specifically allocated to adult protective services. So that's very heartening um, to know that adult, adult protective services will, will receive money that's, that's actually targeted just for them. Um, the legislation also extends temporary waivers that allow states unlimited transfer authority between congregate and home delivered meals. Again, um, even more uh, protecting those flexibilities. Um, and so, so we are pleased with that. In general, um, this particular COVID relief uh, was much less than, um, than the previous relief was. Um, and it's similar to, um, uh, for the AAAs at least in terms of meals, it's similar to the Families First Corona um, Virus Relief Act. Um, Although we were expect it to be a little bit a little bit less than that, um, and we but any relief is is good relief. Um, the the work that the area agencies on aging have been providing, um, really being the frontline workers in making sure that um, people continue to have contact, continue to have meals delivered to their homes, um, has been absolutely essential and critical throughout the pandemic. And so every little bit helps. Um, and we, we hope that this money um, will be received to the states, um, will be allocated to the states so that we um, at DARS can disseminate it to the AAAs very quickly. So we're hoping to, to get that money in the, in the next few weeks. Um, so that, that is some good news there. Also on the good news front, um, our No Wrong Door um, team has been very, very busy uh, in recent months, um, and we want to give them big, big congratulations for being the winners um, of the Administration for Community Living's Mental Health Challenge. Its Social Connector Solution demonstrates technology improving the lives of people in need, and it was presented uh, a na this national um, recognition at the famed Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. So we're so, so proud of our No Wrong Door team for receiving this national um, award challenge. Um, the Social Health Connector um, 
uh, proposal by the No Wrong Door team aims to engage people in a reflective person-centered virtual conversation about the benefits of social connectedness and how resources and technology can help to maintain or improve health. The tool itself aggregates information from databases operated by the team partners and other vetted sources about devices, electronic applications and services that can help users connect and engage. The project builds upon several existing resources, including No Wrong Door Virginia, Virginia Navigator, Elder Care Locator, and 211. In addition to the Virginia team being announced as winners of the mental health challenge, No Wrong Door Virginia will also play a key role in piloting and launching the rollout of this national campaign and initiative to combat social isolation. Specifically, No Wrong Door Virginia alongside with United Way Worldwide and 211 nationally, will be engaged in the National Commit to Connect campaign with AARP Foundation's role as the coordinating center supporting the initiative. So we're super, super excited for No Wrong Door and this new initiative. Also, yesterday, No Wrong Door launched its person-centered portal on easy access. It's simple access, responsive design, um, uses Virginia Navigator's search for services uh, and also works with 211's call specialists via live 24-7 uh, access to 211 um, via live chat or toll-free um, live caller. Um, and it also um, features uh, uh, accessibility um, and the person themselves can refer to all the services that they need. So we're really excited about this. We've, it's been in the works for some time and it's just yet another um, innovative tool in the No Wrong Door toolkit. Um, another thing that No Wrong Door has been working on is working with the DARS Office for Aging Services to work with Chronic Disease Self-Management Program to add available workshops into Virginia Navigator's event calendar where consumers can select a class and self-refer to the AAA where it will be offered using No Wrong Door Direct Connect. A similar effort around falls prevention and matter of balance programs will follow. This effort will be an opportunity to align with chronic disease self-management program work across technology platforms, both at DARS and is managed with Virginia Department of Health. So related to that, I just wanna share with you a few new grants that we have in the works. We've just applied for two new falls prevention grants, one large and one small. Um, both will expand the A Matter of Balance program and bingo size that we're already working on. So this will expand that and help to reduce falls and fall risk among older adults and adults with disabilities. And it will also more importantly, allow us to serve more participants across the Commonwealth. In addition to that, we also want to expand the very critical lifespan respite voucher program. This has really been a, a grant that we've um, worked on for a long time. Uh, it just provides a small one-time voucher for caregivers who are providing very much needed relief and respite. Um, and we really need to um, build on this um, program and provide uh, this respite to caregivers. And so um, we hope you will join us in supporting this effort to uh, extend this um, Lifespan Respite Program grant. So those are some, some grants that we're working on. And then finally, we have some new faces at DARS. Um, some of, some of them you may have already um, began, begun working with. Uh, the first is John Carpenter. Uh, we're delighted uh, that he's joined our team. Uh, he came on several weeks ago as the Director of Administration for the Division for Community Living. And in this new role, John will support our division by providing oversight in the areas of administrative support, financial and grants management, fiscal monitoring, data analysis, and oversight of contracts, primarily within the Office for Aging Services. He joins our division with nearly 30 years of human services and finance experience. He has a bachelor's degree from Ithaca College and a master's from Virginia Tech. 
both in the field of education. His many, he has many years, um, almost 20 years of experience working at the Department of Social Services, holding supervisory and management roles in the Division of Finance until being promoted to the Division of Benefit Programs, where he was the Quality Assurance Manager responsible for overseeing statewide audit and compliance reviews for programs such as SNAP, Medicaid, CHIP, and TANF. After he left social services, he moved to the Virginia Employment Commission where he held uh, roles such as accounting manager, chief of workforce special programs, and the director of workforce administration, in addition to serving on the economic crisis task force and COVID-19 panel. So we're delighted to have John on board with us. We hope when you get a chance to meet him, you'll give him a warm welcome. In addition, we talked a lot about No Wrong Door and all of its work. Um, no Wrong Door welcomed Catherine McDonald, No Wrong Door Project Specialist. In this new role, Catherine will be do, doing a lot of things, um, but she'll be instrumental in supporting implementation of key projects for Virginia's No Wrong Door COVID-19 relief grant, launch of the person-centered portal, which I just mentioned started yesterday, um, guidance documentation for remote virtual person-centered options counseling services, as well as engagement for aligning aging disability services in our Virginia assistive technology system. She'll also be a key member on Virginia's No Wrong Door team developing the Social Health Connector for that project that just won the national award. So um, she, in addition to that, she's a gerontologist based in Richmond who previously served as the director of the longevity project that many of you all formally, formally know was called the Greater Richmond Age Wave. So she comes to us with a world of experience and we're just thrilled to have her on board. Finally, we have Liza White, who is our lifespan respite coordinator, also a Virginia Tech grad, who has just been so enthusiastic, hit the ground running, um, came on board, learned the ropes from Nick Slintz, and um, it will also be helping us with the new grant. So I know that was a lot packed in there and you all have a big agenda, but I'd be happy to an answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Marsha. Any questions for Marsha? Beverly, this is Carter. I have a quick question. Um, Marsha, I noticed that the 50 million um, from the Elder Justice, you referenced that. I'm curious, have you received any um, guidance from um, ACL about how that money is to be used? Because it, you know, doing simple math, which I know is dangerous with this, but I mean, if you say each state gets 50, uh, gets 1 million of that, that's roughly 10% of how much the 19 report for APS uh, spending was. So, it, you know, it could be a sizable chunk. So I'm just curious what they are targeting that to be spent on specifically, if you've seen anything. We haven't gotten any guidance yet. When you do, I would love to um, to know how ACL um, is, is, what guidance they're providing your agency related to that. We would too, Carter, thank you. Thanks, Carter. Any other comments or questions before we move on? If not, thank you both for your presentations today for the updates. So we are now at a very important stage in our, in our council today because we're about to present the final version of the bylaws, which we've been working on. And as you might remember, we had a committee that met over the summer that was comprised of myself, Amy Duncan and Tresselyn Kelly. And I want to thank each of them, Amy and Tresselin, for their time and input into the committee work. And at the September meeting, uh, staff assisted us in presenting the suggested bylaws and electronic meeting policies for consideration. So today, I'd like to ask Charlotte to please walk us through the final steps to adopt these. Charlotte? Thank you, Beverly. Um, council members have received copies of the final bylaws and the final electronic meeting policy as part of today's meeting materials. These were also posted on the council's SharePoint site. 
These documents are presented in their final form and remain unchanged from the September versions that were presented except for two changes. The first change in the bylaws is a small technical change to clarify when the secretary is selected by a chair and confirmed by the council. That is underlined and can be found on pages four and then the top of page five. The second change to the bylaws is underlined at the bottom of page nine in the section outlining the parameters for the best practices committee. As the best practices committee meeting timeframe has shifted over the last two years, it has not always been feasible to bring the winners before the council for a, a vote. Logistically, it would help for the bylaws committee to have the authority to officially decide on winners when it is not feasible for the council to meet in advance. If these documents receive a two thirds vote of approval, they'll take effect today. The two documents, um, if you, they remain unchanged from how they were presented or um, they could be adopted under or within one motion if that such an action is made. Are there any questions or concerns following Charlotte's report? Well, not hearing any, um, we are now at a point where we can approve the bylaws and electronic meeting policy through motion. So I would like to entertain a first motion. Madam Chair, this is Carter Harrison. I so move. This is Roland Johnny Winston. Oh. I second. Any further discussion? Okay, if not hearing any, Charlotte, you can do the roll. Thank you. David? Aye. Harvey? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Amy? Aye. Joni? Aye. Carter? Aye. Carla? Aye. Diana? Aye. Debbie? Aye. Catherine? Aye. Tina? Aye. Everly? Yes. Michael? Aye. Jay? Aye. Roland? Aye. Erica? Aye. Beverly, this um, motion does have the needed two thirds vote of the council to be adopted. Thank you. Um, so now we have reached the point where we can uh, establish a nominating committee for chair and vice chair. So a nominating committee is supposed to meet this spring and come up with a slate for the chair and vice chair for elections that'll be held at our April 28th meeting. And um, the chair and vice chair are two year terms or until, until successors are elected by the council. They can succeed themselves once provided that such succession is consistent with the terms of appointment of the council. So once a new chair is elected, then the chair appoints a secretary who also serves a two years term, which is subject to confirmation by the council at that same meeting. And the newly elected officers will assume their roles upon the adjournment at the April 28th meeting. Uh, so per the bylaws, the com nominating committee is to be comprised of five members. The chair appoints two members and three are elected by the majority of the members present today. So in advance of today's meeting, I sought interest in, from two people in serving on the nominating committee. And I'm submitting the names of Carter Harrison and Catherine Reed to be appointed to the nominating committee. So we now have three other slots available and I'd like to find out which members would like to volunteer uh, to serve in that capacity. 
uh, nominating commit nominated members should consent to the nomination before we vote on it. So with the three names that you all recommend, we'll start with suggestion with recommendations. So is there are there recommendations for name one, the first name, the second name, and then the third name to comprise that the rest of the meetings. I'm open to that. So is there a make? Do we have volunteers? Beverly, I'm sorry, Amy, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I, I would do that. I would do uh, be on the nominating committee. Thank you. And this is Jay White. Yes, I'll volunteer. Thank you. We need a third. This is Joni Goldwasser. I'll be glad to volunteer. Good. So is there a motion now to add those three names to the nominating committee? I'll accept a motion. This is Roland. So moved. Catherine Reed, second. Any further discussion? Not. Charlotte, please conduct the poll. Okay. Uh, David? Aye. Harvey? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Amy? Aye. Joni? Aye. Carter? Aye. Carla? Aye. Diana? Aye. Debbie? Aye. Catherine? Aye. Tina? Aye. Beverly? Aye. Michael? Aye. Jay? Aye. Roland? Aye. Erica? Aye. Beverly, the motion is passed. Thank you. Charlotte, I think you're going to be in touch with the nominating committee members to schedule a committee meeting. Is that correct? Very good. Thank you. Uh, yes. Moving along. And Beverly, I just want to let everyone Beverly, I just want to let people know that Tara Ragland, who's an ex officio member, has joined the meeting as well. Welcome, Tara. Uh, in the next order of business, we will have a presentation uh, by Catherine Reed on the Best Practices Award Committee and the process for um, the Best Practices Committee. Catherine? Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I apologize for keeping my video on mute, but I have limited bandwidth. Mm. I also would like to acknowledge uh, the assistance of Charlotte in preparing these remarks. I'm pleased to provide an update on the upcoming 2021 Best Practices Awards process. The 2021 Best Practices Committee includes myself, Diana, Jay, Tina, and Jennifer. And I would also like to acknowledge and note that Dr. Richard Lindsay, David Farnham, and Vernon Wadley all rotated off of the council and the committee over the summertime. And we're really pleased to welcome our new committee members, Jay, Jennifer, and Tina. We are pleased to report also that Dominion Energy has once again approved to sponsor the Best Practices Awards. We will have a $5,000 award for first place, $3,000 for second place, and $2,000 for third place. And these financial awards are helpful for organizations and programs during normal years, but they were instrumental last year as social services and programs were dealing with the COVID-19 fallout. So the request for nominations for this 2021 uh, Best Practices Awards will open on Friday, January 29th, 2021. That's in a couple days. The DARS staff will share information about the request for nominations with the council and within its network. And we ask that you please also share the request for nominations around and with your networks as well so that we can get the word out as much as possible. The nominations will be due on March 8th, 2021. And the Best Practices Committee meeting is scheduled for March 17th, 2021 to make the award decisions. 
Now, DARS will again work to get the winners included in the Older Virginians Month proclamation from the governor's office, and that'll happen in May of 2021. And the committee hopes to host another virtual webinar event to recognize the winners later this summer. Um, DARS and the committee will also be monitoring for the potential uh, to host on-site in-person recognition ceremonies. That's what we've done historically, but obviously did not do it during um, 2020. And we will also be looking for uh, potential opportunities to share information about the winners at the Governor's Conference on Aging. So that concludes my report for the Best Practices Committee. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this time? This is Charlotte. I think with the new adoption of the bylaws, we don't need a vote um, on the process now. Okay, thank you. Then if there are not any additional suggestions and questions, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this report and for the work that you all have done. Okay, uh, we are now moving into the legislative update and Erica Wood will be presenting that. Um, she's gonna give us an update on the special session, the governor's introduced, introduced budget and the 2021 regular session. There has been a lot of legislative activity over this past year. And currently, as you know, it, for progress right now, at least we hope there's progress and we'll do our best to provide members with the most pressing information. So Erica, please um, join us now with your, pre with your update. Okay, thanks so much, Beverly. I hope you can all hear me. I'm gonna give you a whirlwind tour because I'm very aware that we wanna spend time. Uh, we wanna save time for the presentation. So I'm gonna go a little bit fast and, um, but there, there should be some time for a little bit of questions and discussions at the end. The other reason that it's a whirlwind tour is because there has been a lot going on despite the fact that this is a shortened session and that there are bill limits, both on the House and Senate side, <clears throat> as to the number of bills that can be introduced, um, there's still a voluminous amount of, of material. So I'm gonna cover three topics. One is the um, seven items that were included in our legislative recommendations in our annual report. We'll look at where those stand. The second is the special session. And the third is the current 2021 session, which is ongoing now. I'd like to recognize Charlotte for the detailed and comprehensive compilations that she has provided for you. So kudos to Charlotte for, for that. And if you haven't looked at them, just glancing through them will give you a really good idea of um, the kinds of things that are going on. So to focus on the seven council recommendations that were included in our annual report. Um, the first was the adult Medicaid dental benefit. And as you know, funding was passed in 2020, unallotted and then restored during the special session with a start date of July 1st, 2021. So that's obviously a huge victory and it aligns with the council's new emphasis on the nutrition of older adults, so yay for that. Second is funding for the state long-term care ombudsman program, particularly important because the ombudsman has, uh, program has made such valuable contributions during the pandemic. But unfortunately, despite discussions with legislators, um, there was no funding action on that this year. We'll keep it on our radar screens. The third is sick leave for direct care workers in nursing homes, assisted living, and home and community-based settings. In the special session, Medicaid personal care aides got hazard pay, and there was a rate increase for personal care, respite, and companion services under the Medicaid waiver. There was also an allowance for overtime pay. And um, this is partly in thanks to the great advocacy of David Broder and SEIU. So um, that's, those are good steps forward. 
uh, as also as far as sick leave, there were a couple of bills introduced on paid sick leave that would be required to be provided by certain employers to certain employees, which could perhaps in some cases include nurse coverage for direct care workers in nursing homes and assisted living. Um, those bills have been referred to appropriations. There was also a bill by Senator Favola that would allow employees who already have sick leave to use it for the care of immediate family members. And that's gone to appropriations too. Uh, fourth on our list of seven is funding for dementia specific case management. And as you may recall in 2020, the General Assembly provided funds that were then unallotted during the pandemic. There are currently budget amendments pending both on the House side and the Senate side. And I know that um, Carter Harrison is, um, is advocating uh, for that. Uh, fifth is funds for the Virginia Center on Aging. Now, I hope that many of you attended the legislative breakfast, the remote breakfast um, this morning, which really gave a very good look into all the dimensions of aging services and research and advocacy uh, that they provide. The 2020 budget provided funds for the center that were then unallotted during the pandemic. In the special session, there was a language budget amendment, that is language only, that clarified the funding and sort of helped to pave the way for future funding. So that's a step in the right direction. Now, the last two items on our, on our platform of seven items, I think um, gained some great visibility and were stymied by the bill legislation, the, the bill limit. So on the, on the House side, House members could only introduce um, uh, seven items, I think, and on the Senate side, 12, not counting budget amendments. But um, so the training on LGBT cultural competency for staff in nursing homes, assisted living and home and community-based services, uh, legislators were approached about this initiative uh, but it did run up against the, those um, bill limitations. But I think that, and I'd like to particularly recognize Roland's advocacy on that. And I think that helped to bring great visibility to the need. Uh, and then finally, there was our item to add report language to the council's duties. So this would enable the council's annual report with the, these with our legislative recommendations, such as we're talking about now, to be electronically sent to all General Assembly members. Uh, the General Assembly members that um, we spoke to, that I spoke to anyway, were very positive about this. And there were many promises for next year, but again, because of the bill limitations, um, it was not to be for this year. So that's kind of where we stand with the seven and in ordinary times, I would stop and ask for questions, but I think I'm gonna plow ahead and then we'll have time for questions at the end because what I wanna do now is to broaden the scope and look beyond our seven at aging related items, both in the special session and in the current 2021 session that's ongoing. So looking at the fall special session, Legislatively, the special session, of course, focused heavily on COVID with bills approved on immunity for certain health and long-term care providers, nursing home visitation, public information about facility outbreaks and telemedicine services. There is also an extension of the moratorium evic um, eviction, ev eviction moratorium. Uh, and on the budget side, there was a, also a lot of, of COVID um, funding activity. Uh, some, lang some of it was language only, um, targeted towards outreach, testing, vaccine distribution, provider rates, and PPE. Uh, following directly on the heels of the fall special session, the governor then presented his budget in December. The, good, the governor's budget as introduced, um, again, of course, focused heavily on COVID, uh, including many of the items that I just mentioned.
But aside from COVID, I think as far as aging related items, it's important to note um, a few things. Uh, for DARS, um, there were no cuts in aging services, and that's a good thing. Just we can't uh, forget to say that. Um, uh, the Department of Social Services, there was a small, very small auxiliary grant rate increase to align with Social Security's cost of living adjustment. That's just a sort of an automatic thing, and it's um, <clears throat> it doesn't um, even begin to touch the real change that's needed. Um, <clears throat> in the Department of Agriculture, so with our new emphasis on food security, we should note that the, part, the Department of Agriculture budget would provide for funding to farmers to supply charitable food assistance organizations. And um, also that the Department for Housing and Community Development budget uh, would include funding for the housing, funding increases for the Housing Trust Fund and the Virginia Rent and Mortgage Relief Program. Okay, so then following on the heels of the governor's budget, of course, came the 2021 budget amendments filed by members. Now, we've already mentioned the budget amendments for dementia-specific case management, and do keep that front and center on your, on your radar. But in addition, there are amendments to, I'm just going to go down this bulleted list, um, provide hazard pay and PPE to essential employees, so support the development of a broadband infrastructure, uh, fund demographic services at DARS. This one is um, very important to area agencies on aging as well as to, to DARS to um, really sh shed some light on demographics. Um, support for the Virginia Food Access Investment Program uh, to facilitate COVID vaccinations, to fund a state infection preventionist for long-term care, to provide rate, um, a rate increase for Medicaid personal care and sick leave for Medicaid consumer directed amendments, to continue the added $20 per day rate for Medicaid reimbursement for nursing homes, to increase the assisted living auxiliary grant rate in certain instances, a, a real increase, not an automatic one. Um, and again, to update the eviction moratorium and requirements and more. Those are just um, some of the, the highlights. So that's the budget side. So then over on the legislative side, as far as what's going on right this moment, and I know that some of you are actually on screen probably attending hearings and multi-purposing at, at, the, at the same time as you're listening, um, because it is so fast paced, because it is a shorter session. Um, and so if I'm out of date on any of these things, please do um, add, add, any, add any updates that you know about. Um, so uh, we've already talked about um, a number of legislative items, and we've already talked about a number of COVID related items. But in addition, I wanted to bring the following, um, I think it's six or eight different particular uh, bills to your attention. The first is that there's a bill both on the House and the Senate side concerning targeting of aging services. So under the Older Americans Act, services are to be targeted to those in greatest social and economic need. These bills would more precisely define what greatest social need means. And um, they're in alignment with the Federal Older Americans Act. Um, there are two bills on the assisted living auxiliary grant, or at least two. Um, one would be an actual, to provide for an actual increase of the rate in certain instances. Uh, and the other, would be to conduct a study, an auxiliary grant study to really sh begin to shed some light on this very important program, which is severely underfunded. Um, there are two bills to provide a nursing home staffing standard. So in many other states, there are nursing home staffing ratios or standards. Um, we don't have that here in Virginia. But on the House side, there is a bill by Delegate Watts and on the Senate side by Senator Kiggins. I understand that Delegate Watts' bill was 
uh, tabled, um, tabled. And the reason it was tabled is because there is currently a Joint Commission on Healthcare study underway or about to begin on nursing home staffing. So it was tabled to await the results of the Joint Commission on Healthcare stu uh, study. Uh, and then I understand that Kagan's bill is supposed to come up. I think it's tomorrow. The study is also mentioned in her bill. So we'll see what happens. Um, there are also bills to provide a tax credit for nursing home staff and a loan repayment program for nursing aides. There are several food, food aid bills that I thought I'd mention in light of our nutrition committee. Um, there is a bill to convene a stakeholder advisory group to evaluate accessory dwelling units, uh, the so-called ADUs, as a strategy to address the need for affordable housing. Uh, there are a number of voting bills, including changes in absentee voting um, and curbside voting. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention the Virginia Saves Program. So there is a bill by Delegate Torian, House Bill 2174, which would direct the governing board of the Virginia College Savings Plan, the 529 plan, to establish an automatic enrollment payment, payroll deduction IRA retirement savings program called Virginia Saves. And this is something that uh, ARP has been working on for a number of years. And I understand <clears throat> that it passed the house yesterday. So those are my really quickie um, high profile highlights. Um, and I'm sure we could discuss this for much longer, but that's it in a nutshell. And I'd be happy to entertain questions or, or discussion. Thank you, Erica. Any any discussion for Erica? Thank you for this very comprehensive report. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from you shortly about what the results of this session. So in the next order of business, we are gonna call on Diana Peck to talk about the Nutrition Special Committee uh, with an update. And I just wanted to um, tell you all that it's very rewarding to know that we are moving forward with the recommendation that we made for looking more into the needs of nutrition for older people. And so with that, Diana, if you would- Thank you, Thank you so much, Beverly. Erica, that was a great report. Uh, the Nutrition Special Committee met on Monday, December 7th, 2020. The committee members were able to hear from Kelly Wright, DARS Nutrition Program Coordinator. Kelly shared information about DARS Nutrition Programs, including home deliver and congre congregate meals and the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program. She also presented on the Virginia Roadmap to End Hunger. This plan is referenced in your meeting announcements packet if you would like to review it more. Kelly also recently presented on a similar topic for the January 19, 2021 Virginia Governor's Conference on Aging webinar series. Information about this webinar series, including how to register for upcoming webinars and view the archives one, is also included in your meeting announcements packet. During the December 7th meeting, members discussed possible ideas that could improve food security and reduce malnutrition in older adults. The committee will meet again in the spring and hopes to bring recommendations back to the council and the legislative committee this summer in time for consideration for legislative recommendations for the 2022 General Assembly sessions. Um, any questions? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Diana. I saw and I overlooked a question that Carla uh, posed to everyone, and I'm sorry we missed that. Carla, did you have a question related to this particular subject, or was that previous a previous question? 
Carla, you're muted. Sorry. Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, that was a question for Erica and, and I put it in the chat. And that was, first of all, thank you for that it was a wonderful presentation update. But it's my understanding that Delegate Rome is working on a study on guardianships. Do you have any information on that or have you heard the same thing? I know that Delegate Rome introduced um, a bill last year and I think it was partly on supported decision-making. So I'm thinking that it may be the next iteration of supported decision-making, but I will check that out and get back to you. Thank you so much. Any I other think the commissioner is gonna say something. This is Kathy Hayfield. Jay Lark is currently doing a study on guardianship and that could be what you were referring to. And that's underway right now. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions before we move, move forward? If not, thank you, uh, Erica. It was a very comprehensive report and we, we appreciate the efforts are, that you are putting into keeping us informed, um, as well as Charlotte who does keep us updated. So um, we are now at a point in our meeting we are uh, looking forward to receiving a long-term care and COVID vaccine update. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah Leinberger and Monica Bazaar and Joni Latimer. Um, we, these are our experts who are joining us today. Uh, we wanna know more about the vaccine rollout and what's going on in long-term care. So Sarah is, has a master's as, as the Healthcare Associated Infections Program Manager in the Division of Clinical Epidemiology. And Monica Bazaar holds a master's of public health as well. She's a COVID-19 infection control consultant in the Division of Clinical Epidemiology. And she's been helpful in the long-term care vaccination planning and communication effort. And a uh, familiar face to us is Joni Latimer, our state long-term care ombudsman. And um, we're very pleased to have the three of you today with us. So uh, join me in welcome, welcoming, welcoming these individuals. Great, thank you, Beverly. This is Sarah Leinberger. Can you hear me? Yes, can you all hear? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. And thanks, Charlotte is gonna run our slides. So um, we're gonna get started and we're gonna get, Monica's gonna give you some vaccine related updates. I am first just gonna show you a little bit of data. It's the data we've been monitoring for long-term care throughout the last um, 10 months just to kind of set the stage and let you know bigger picture what we've been doing. I'm going to run through all this pretty quickly. Happy to take questions or, or discuss this further at the end. And Charlotte, um, I've, sent this, I've shared the slides with Charlotte so she can share those with you all after this. Um, and obviously all the, the data are subject to change. We've tried to put in data as, as updated as today for some of these numbers. So this should give you a good picture of what's happening on the ground right now. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And you can go to the third slide. Okay, great. So this is just a picture of what COVID-19 outbreaks have looked like. This is data that can be found on the VDH website. And typically we look at outbreak data broken out by settings. And as you all are well aware, long-term care facilities have been greatly impacted during this response. And so those are in red and that includes nursing homes, assisted living facilities and other types of long-term care settings, including group homes. Um, so you can see that we had a peak and really got started <laughs> got started really quickly um, end of March, beginning of April with a lot of outbreaks in long-term care facilities, saw a decrease in the summer and early fall. And you can see that in December, there was an increase in the percentage of outbreaks reported in long-term care facilities. This 
these data are current as of January 20th. Um, so far, the outbreaks reported in January have followed a similar trend to December, um, with long-term care facilities making up about 41% of all outbreaks entered in the system. You can go to the next slide. So there are a lot of ways to slice and dice these data. <laughs> this is another way we've looked at the outbreak data. Again, this is for all long-term care facilities. So the orange line is a sort of a similar curve to the overall curve you saw in the last slide. Those are just number of outbreaks in long-term care facilities by month. But then if you look at the blue and gray bars, the blue gray, or sorry, the blue bars are average cases per outbreak. So you can see in March and April, there were a large number of cases per outbreak, um, about 48 or 49 per outbreak. Again, that was that, that immediate spike we saw in the spring really, really quickly after the first cases in Virginia were identified. The number of cases, if you follow the blue bars across the screen, you can see that the number of cases did decline per outbreak um, in the summer and early fall and have gone back up. So the December data on this slide are likely incomplete. Some of our outbreak data take a, a little while to catch up um, because it, it takes time to close out the outbreak and, and determine how many cases and, and deaths there were associated with that outbreak. So the December data are likely an undercount at this point in terms of the, the number of cases and deaths. A little bit of good news, if you look at the gray bars, those are average deaths per outbreak in long-term care. And you can see that that was around nine per outbreak in March and April. That has decreased and remained um, less than what we saw in the spring. So that may indicate, you know, that even though we're still seeing a lot of cases and outbreaks, and that really has gone up in, since December, um, that we're, you know, potentially better prepared to, to deal with those cases and not seeing quite as many deaths. You can go to the next slide. So this is a busy slide, um, but not very hard to understand. So in Virginia, we break our, for public health response, we break our state into five regions. And this is just showing number of outbreaks per region. So for example, if you look at the light blue color in Northern region, Northern region saw a lot of outbreaks in long-term care facilities in the beginning of the pandemic. There was a lot of transmission happening in the Northern region, you know, around DC, very populated area and not as many outbreaks happening in other regions of the state, although there, there were some. And as you all, I'm sure, are aware, COVID has sort of, the transmission of COVID in the community has sort of moved across the state, so that by the summer, we were seeing more transmission, for example, in southwest Virginia, which is the dark blue. So, Essentially, this, we've used this graph to highlight what we're seeing nationally as well, and that is when increases of COVID-19 are seen in the community, we also see increases of outbreaks in long-term care facilities. So if there's really high transmission in the community, the long-term care facility, nursing home, assisted living, et cetera, can be doing everything possibly right, and that doesn't mean COVID's not going to come in. Obviously, I'm sure you all have talked a lot about visitation and that has been very restricted, but you still have staff and others coming in and out of facilities every day. So there's no way to avoid absolutely no, you know, you can't avoid um, uh, bringing COVID into facilities, um, even if you have really good infection control practices in place. So, Again, this overall curve of the graph sort of follows what we've seen in Virginia. We had this spike in April, and then, you know, we're experiencing surge right now in Virginia. And this is just sort of showing you that as transmission moved across the state, we also saw that in long-term care facilities as well. Okay. Um, oh, and in December, just giving you a little bit of data from this graph, in December, the highest proportion of outbreaks in long-term care facilities occurred in the central region of the state. So that's like Richmond and South at 26%, followed by the Northwest part of the state, which includes 
Winchester and um, Charlottesville and Stanton, all those areas, and then eastern and northern regions and southwest actually dropped a little in December. Okay, I have one more data slide. I promise I'm not going to do too much data. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, this data, we actually get a lot more data right now from nursing homes compared to the other types of long-term care facilities. And that, as you all know, nursing homes fall under CMS and there are CMS requirements in place right now for COVID reporting from nursing homes. So we are getting a fair amount of data reported weekly from nursing homes. Um, and communicate with CDC and other federal partners on, on these data weekly. So this is only nursing, the, all the other slides I've shown you have been all long-term care across the state. This is only nursing homes. So in nursing homes, the red line on this graph is showing you new resident cases in the past week. And the orange line is showing you new resident deaths in the past week. So the trend is, is not good right now. Um, we are very concerned about this that, um, and again, this is reflective of what's happening in the community as well. And really our region of the country, Virginia um, is seeing a lot of transmission right now. And we're also seeing that in nursing homes. So you can see that the red line continues to go up with the number of residents. Um, with new cases of COVID, these data are as of January 10th. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So what have we been doing? Obviously, we've been very concerned about the long-term care population um, at BDH and, and really across state agencies. So as was mentioned earlier on the call, um, Governor Northam did establish a COVID-19 long-term care task force in April. Um, I've been staffing that task force directly under the leadership of Dr. Lori Forlano, who's one of our um, deputy commissioners at BDH. And we've had Joni and others from DARS, um, as mentioned, as part of this task force, really a lot, a very broad membership, um, and appreciate all the input and partnership that we've received. So the task force um, obviously was was set up to try to strengthen resources and, and have broad representation looking at this problem in long-term care. And you can see we've had some different subcommittees over the course of the past year. Um, it, it's crazy to think it's been a year, but at BDH, we really have been working on this response now for about a year. You can go to the next slide. So in terms of resources provided to long-term care facilities through the task force, um, a lot of guidance documents, data, communication tools, the type of data I showed you today, a lot of it's available on the website, um, and some of it is not on the website, but is shared regularly with task force um, members and other stakeholders. Another way that we've been supporting directly from BDH is just the ongoing support from local health departments for facilities in their communities and the VDH Office of Licensure and Certification under direction of CMS has conducted um, focused infection control surveys of nursing homes. So you can see even through the end of December, they conducted almost 800 of those. So certainly a lot of attention um, on nursing homes and other facilities when they, when they are having an outbreak. A lot of testing resources have been directed to this population, including support from the Virginia National Guard throughout the summer and fall to conduct testing events in long-term care facilities. That's been both in nursing homes and assisted living and, and other settings. A lot of support to um, distribute additional personal protective equipment um, some of those pushbacks have been coming directly from the federal government. Some of it's been coordinated at the state level. There have been a lot of layers to that. Um, and we're keeping an eye on needs weekly um, reported by nursing homes. A lot of infection control resources. My team at BDH um, partnered with health, the federal agency, Health and Human Services, to provide um, on-site infection prevention and control assessments. We did about 200 in June and July, so going into facilities and trying to do some pre some prevention and have make sure facilities were ready um, for cases and outbreaks. Some had already experienced outbreaks, but there are always 
um, improvements that can be made. I always tell people with infection prevention and control, you know, some of it's just reminders are helpful, just like we remind, um, you know, people to brush their teeth or people to wash their hands. Like all of these things can become routine, but additional education and services reminders are, are helpful, um, especially when, when facilities are under tremendous stress. Um, I think, you know, an extra set of eyes is always helpful and we continue to provide a lot of remote assistance to facilities as well. And Monica is going to talk shortly about the vaccine clinics. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a list of resources. We have tried to have sort of a one-stop shop for the task force and all the guidance that's been developed by both BDH and Department of Social Services and other agencies. Anything that we're aware of, we've been trying to put in one place on this task force webpage. So if you haven't seen it, I invite you to, to visit that website. And these are just some recent um, documents posted or updated for facilities. You can go to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to Monica Bazaar to talk specifically about vaccination. Monica? Yes. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica Bazaar. I work with Sarah on her team um, helping with COVID-19 infection uh, prevention and control. Uh, I also am, has, have been helping out with uh, vaccine logistics and operations for the long-term care facilities. Uh, so I, want to, I wanted to provide an update today. Um, you can go to the next slide, Charlotte. Okay, so long-term care facilities uh, fall under phase 1A in vaccine pan vaccination planning in Virginia. Um, as most of you know, some districts in Virginia have moved to vaccinating phase 1B, uh, but we want to reiterate the fact that just because some districts have moved to phase 1B does not mean that, not, that they are not going to vaccinate people in phase 1A. Some areas in the Commonwealth are moving to different phases expeditiously um, to ensure a critical mass of Virginians are vaccinated against COVID-19 as quickly as possible. Some overlap of phases and subgroups within phases will are needed to ensure um, vaccination is administered effectively. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to talk about the long-term care federal pharmacy partnership program. So CDC has contracted with uh, CVS and Walgreens to uh, provide uh, or administer vaccines to long-term care populations in almost all states except West Virginia. Uh, all skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities are being vaccinated via federal pharmacy partnership program in Virginia. Uh, this, this partnership is further divided into part A and part B. Um, in part A, nursing homes, uh, all the nursing homes in Virginia are covered. And in part B, all the assisted living facilities and some other facilities that have signed up, signed up um, are covered. Some other facilities include continue, continuing care retirement communities, personal care homes, uh, residential group homes, you know, et cetera. The list is provided on the slides. But um, as of January 27th, like this morning, 297 clinics have occurred in skilled nursing facilities to administer first doses. Um, CVS and Walgreens are working to schedule second and third cl clinics. Coming to Part B, uh, which, which covers ALFs and some other facilities, it was activated on December 31st to uh, begin vaccinations as early as January 11th. And as of this morning, 538 clinics have occurred in these facilities to administer first doses. CVS and Walgreens are still contacting facilities to schedule clinics. Uh, so the total number of vaccines administered as of this morning in this population for, resident, for residents and staff of long-term care facilities is 75,069 uh, doses. But um, I, I, I wanted to let you all know that this is still an underrepresented, underestimated, underrepresented number because there is uh, an issue with um, data lag and it, 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 it takes for people to ad, uh, report the vaccines administered and to us. So this 
these numbers uh, these numbers are being updated on the vaccine dashboard the vdh vaccine dashboard um and i have a link to that uh, dashboard on a different slide but um um, one more thing is facilities that are not covered by the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program but belong to Phase 1A are, are uh, we have instructed them to work with their local health departments or their affiliated pharmacies to ensure vaccinations. So right now we are, um, sorry, go to second, uh, next slide, please. Um, so right now we are working to register and allocate vaccine to community pharmacies, uh, including long-term care affiliated pharmacies. Like even, even though um, the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program is focused on vaccinating um, skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities, some independent living facilities may, vaccine via, uh, may receive vaccine via this partnership if they share campus with a nursing home or assisted living facility. And... Um, Right now, we are working on matching these community pharmacies to independent living facilities uh, that need vaccine clinics. Uh, we are hoping to release uh, more information on this uh, like real soon. Uh, we, are on, we, we are in the final leg of planning and vaccinations will begin in independent living facilities uh, re very soon. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the resources that are on the uh, VDH COVID-19 vaccine page um, for long-term care uh, facilities. Um, so there are some frequently asked questions. Uh, we update every um, week on Wednesdays. Uh, we try to answer um, all the questions we receive from different avenues um, and we, we, uh, we put them in, in that document. And there is also another document. Um, it's called a lessons learned document. So um, while these clinics are happening at the long-term care facilities by CVS and Walgreens, we are receiving feedback from facilities uh, about the best practices and what can be, uh, you know, uh, what are the areas that can have improvements so that such kind of feedback. So we are uh, putting everything in this document um, for other facilities to access. And uh, this document is also updated regularly and it is also on the long term vaccine long term care web page. And uh, there is a, there is the link to the vaccine dashboard. Um, uh, like I said earlier, like these number these numbers are not real time. Um, Sometimes it takes up to three days for the numbers uh, for the for us to receive the vaccine administration numbers. So uh, keep that in mind while you're looking at the um, dashboard. But uh, CVS and Walgreens they have um, they post the uh, vaccination data on their websites. These are updated daily, and these are the most uh, updated numbers. So if you want to look at the uh, these are aggregate numbers for the states, so uh, you won't be able to see it, um, like resident versus uh, staff number, uh, vaccination numbers. Um, and um, next, uh, next slide, please. Oh, you can go to the next slide. We would like to um, address some current hot topics uh, pertaining to the long-term care uh, facilities. So we are receiving questions from facilities about when they can relax uh, restrictions and um, you know infection prevention and control practices after vaccinations. Um, so we want to address that. The re the reason that current guidance around testing and visitation have not yet been modified is because um, the vaccines with an FDA emergency use authorization have primarily been showing to decrease the incidence of symptomatic disease, but their effect on transmission and asymptomatic infections are less clear. So CDC is working to better understand the effect of the vaccine on preventing infection and transmission before modifying any infection prevention and control testing or quarantine recommendations. And CDC is also um, actively discussing and in conversation with CMS um, on uh, changes to visitation guidance. But uh, while the current guidance remains unchanged, we plan to provide regular updates um, 
over the coming week uh, if there are any potential uh, changes. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, there is a lot of interest in how many uh, residents and staff are agreeing to take COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, we do not have good denominators for the number of staff working in long-term care facilities in Virginia. Um, it's not a static number. So the denominator, denominators are inconsistent, which makes it harder to calculate rates and percentages. But we estimate that current census in nursing homes is about 20, 22,000 um, residents with about 30,000 staff. Uh, the number of doses given in long-term care facilities um, which is included on slide 12. Note this num um, these numbers are all long-term care facilities, including nursing homes and assisted living facilities. But based on the data we have now, um, we have not been able to determine how many of those doses were specifically given in nursing homes. Um, but you can see that more doses have been given to residents compa uh, compared to staff. Uh, based on our estimates, the percentage uptake uh, in staff is potentially up to 50%, uh, lower compared to um, uptake in residents in uh, Virginia long-term care facilities. Um, CDC used national data last week to estimate that 76% of residents and 37% of staff are accepting the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, but we think it is a little higher, um, uh, a little higher staff ac acceptance rate in Virginia. But uh, CVS let us know this week that they are administering approximately 30% more doses in second clinics, which may be a good sign and mean additional staff are ex accepting the vaccine. Um, Sarah, do you want to take the next slide? Yeah, you can go to the next slide. I just wanted to touch on a couple other things that we're getting a lot of questions and feedback about just for your awareness. Um, one is, you know, as you can see from the data I've presented, our facilities are in surge right now. So one topic that continues to come up that we've been talking about throughout this response is about transfer of residents between acute and long-term care. Um, our local health departments during normal outbreak response for other organisms such as flu or norovirus will often have a nursing home or assisted living facility close to new admissions for um, usually a few days, sometimes one or two incubation periods to make sure that the facility has the resources they need and can get the get transmission under control before accepting new patients. Um, right now, we have communicated with our local health departments over the last several weeks that there is a need to be flexible with those recommendations. Um, COVID has a longer incubation period than something like flu, and we cannot close nursing homes and other long-term care facilities to new admissions because of surge also being seen in hospitals and really across the healthcare spectrum. So there's this need um, to be able at the local level to be able to really assess, you know, the overall picture in the community and to be able to transfer residents, even if, even if they're still positive for COVID, you know, as long as, the, as long as they're clinically able to move into post-acute care to be able to, to, you know, facilitate that transfer. So this is something that we've talked about a lot with the long-term care and hospital associations and, you know, continue to, to try to monitor and, and these conversations, we really emphasize, you know, the need to, for these conversations to happen at the local level and with the understanding of what's happening in the community. You can go to the next slide. Also related to surge, um, it, our staffing issues. Again, staffing is something we've talked about throughout the pandemic. It's been, I would say, the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge throughout the pandemic response when we're talking about long-term care. Um, you know, in the summer and fall, we were able to dedicate some resources. The Medical Reserve Corps of Virginia has been phenomenal just in general during this response. Um, and they really in the spring and summer when some 
nursing staff and other staff were furloughed in hospitals when hospitals really weren't seeing a surge in the spring. Some of those staff members were able to go in and, and provide crisis or emergency staffing in long-term care facilities. Um, the National Guard did not provide any clinical care in long-term care facilities, but they have done a lot. We talked about how they've gone in and done testing. They have also done training for staff for PPE and conducted fit testing for respirator use of long-term care staff. Um, these resources, while they still exist, are also being pulled into the vaccine response, and so they really aren't as readily available right now, especially the Medical Reserve Corps really isn't as available right now to provide crisis staffing and long-term care. Um, currently, we are hearing from facilities that they are in, in surge in terms of staffing. Um, I checked in with some providers yesterday, and that's what I was hearing. We did reiterate current CDC and VDH guidance in a recent document published on the website, which lays out different options. Um, if facilities, you know, are in contingency or crisis phases, then staff may work even if they've been exposed, if they're asymptomatic. And if in crisis, some facilities are even having positive COVID staff members work. You know, there are precautions in, in place when that happens, for example, having positive staff only working on hot or, or COVID units. Um, but really this, you know, this isn't ideal. It isn't what we would do in normal times and just kind of wanted to let you know that that is occurring in some facilities um, as we really experience this incredible surge in Virginia. Okay, I have one more slide if you go to the next slide. And that, that is, I just wanted to mention the new variants. I'm sure you're seeing this in the news. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is constantly mutating, which most viruses do. Um, but certain variants have recently gained global attention. Some of the variants may be um, watched more closely or be of more public health interest if they affect transmissibility and or our immune response. Um, the first case of B117 variant was identified in Virginia and there was a press release this week about that case in Northern Virginia. So you can check that out if you haven't um, seen that news, that's the variant being called the UK variant. So the investigation around that case continues and to date, I'm not aware that that involves um, long-term care at all, but just wanted you to be aware of that. But I did want to let you know that DCLS, our state public health lab, was actually one of the first public health labs in the country to sequence SARS-CoV-2 and participate in this ongoing testing. And we have been sequencing samples from a lot of our outbreaks, including outbreaks in long-term care facilities. DCLS has sequenced over 1,700 Virginia patient specimens. Um, there have been different strains circulating in Virginia, again, as expected, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anything changes until there's an, an interesting variant that may cause changes. So there's additional information on the CDC website. The reason we're watching this is to make sure that even if there's a new variant, to make sure that our testing, the testing we use remains effective. So make sure we could, you know, a positive is still a positive, even if it's a different a different strain of the virus, and also watching for vaccine efficacy um, and how well the vaccine will work for these new strains. So that is ongoing work and just wanted to put that on your radar. That's all we have, Charlotte. Um, we're happy to take any questions right now. Also happy to receive questions later via email. Um, I think we there might be some questions, but I did also want everybody to know that uh, Joni Latimer, the state long-term care ombudsman, did have a conflict arise and had to jump off the meeting. So we do have a little bit more time for questions here. We do have some additional announcements at the end of the meeting, but um, I will let Beverly kind of see if she wants to open the floor for any questions or further discussion. Yes. 
Yes, we do have a few minutes now to to entertain questions if anyone has one. And um, I would like to find out if you all have any information about vaccine availability for older adults in the community, other since so many have not been given the opportunity through clinics um, or pharmacies. Do you have any suggestions for people who are 65, 75, 85, what to do about accessing the vaccine? Sure, Monica, do you wanna take that question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, frankly speaking, um, I'm not included in those discussions, but um, the best the best way is to reach out to uh, your healthcare provider or your uh, local health department. Uh, as there is limited supply, uh, they can only they're only able to provide um, vaccines to limited people each week. But they are collecting data as to like uh, if you pre-register, they are collecting the, their data and including those numbers in like um, uh, when they're uh, requesting for vaccines. Um, so um, the best way I think is probably to start with your uh, local health department. Well, the reality is that it's very difficult to even, you know, access people to talk to. So if you have any suggestions for individual for, for us to convey some information that would be helpful too. And I see that um, Carter Harrison has a question he would like to ask, as well as Catherine Reed and David Broder. So in that order, let's do that. Let's talk, ask you those questions. Carter, you want to go first? Beverly, I'm I'm highly concerned about the um, sort of feedback that we've been hearing from the community, not just um, in the public comments, but also uh, I saw in the paper that's relatively near me in the Farmville Herald, there has been discussions about how people in group 1C have been receiving vaccines ahead of group 1B and um, issues related to that. And they seem to be um, decisions made at the local health district level that are contrary to what's coming from the state. And I, my question to uh, my friends at the health department are, um, how can we get ahead of some of these issues and make sure that people that are, um, are receiving the vaccines in the order in which um, the health department is describing? Because I'm just not sure that that's actually occurring out in the communities right now. Sure, this is Sarah. I, I think we can speak to this generally. Monica's on the vaccine team, but we certainly are not the vaccine leads and, and certainly understand all these questions are, are coming up and we would be happy to take questions back as well. Um, I, I know the governor is having a press conference right now and also addressing um, some of these vaccine related questions. But I think, and Monica, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think the idea is that phase is 1A, 1B, 1C, that they were never necessarily intended to operate in silos, but we knew at some point they would also be happening at the same time. Um, that being said, we the, sta the state is definitely in tune with the concerns that not everyone in phase 1A has received vaccine. So there's been a lot of push from state leadership, our agency, but also really the governor's office um, for this, for the vaccination for phases 1A to, to speed up and some, and um, CVS and Walgreens, which Monica mentioned, we've been working with, with this federal partnership um, ha have been pushed and, and are pushing to complete more vaccine clinics um, in these long-term care facilities as quickly as possible so that you know, everybody's received first and second doses um, as soon as possible. That being said, agree, phase 1B is also starting in some communities as there's availability. I would just say that doesn't mean we've forgotten about phase 1A. Um, 
but yeah, I acknowledge that some of them are happening at the same time, but there's also a recognition and push from state leadership to to try to catch anyone in phase 1A who hasn't yet received vaccine. I don't know, Monica, do you have anything else to add? Um, no, Sarah, uh, I don't have anything to add. Um, the best way I think is to check out the vaccine website of and um, they clearly have like a pre registration and um, you know other information that is regularly updated. Um, and I, I'll definitely take this back and see if we can um, sh share, uh, sh share uh, you know uh, anything with you with y'all in the future. Yeah, you know, this part, if I can just sort of follow up with that, Beverly, just one. Yeah, please. I, the, the systems that we're supposed to use to sign up are not functioning. Um, I, I I serve on the board of a AAA. The community seniors that are supposed to be in the 1B section where they're supposed to contact their health department, the health departments aren't even answering the phones anymore. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know where the problem is specifically, but I, I think folks are having trouble accessing it. It's not so much the one A's um, because I think the facility rollout is occurring as promptly as possible, but the one B's where um, you have those that are age 65 plus in the community. So just, sorry, Beverly, I didn't mean to take up much time. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, uh, we have, we are running out of time, but I know that- Beverly, this is, this is Charlotte. Yes. Um, Sarah and Monica, I'm not sure if you can stay a little bit beyond 2.30 or um, what your schedule looks like for the council members. If we're, um, we could go a little bit over the 2.30 time we had, budgeted some cushion for for this um if you would if you wanted to do anything formally action though um we still obviously have to have a quorum for that to happen but just wanted to give an update on that and yeah. and sarah and monica i'm not sure what your schedule is like but okay we Charlotte, have could, questions if oh i'm sorry who was speaking um this is deborah silverman can i make a quick comment please sure. i think i was next in the lineup actually yeah. Catherine reed and david are, we're next to be uh, in line. So Deborah, could you hold on a minute? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to echo Beverly's statements and Carter's statements about access to information and being able to sign up and how the health department has just uh, needs to reevaluate their communication practices with our older Virginia yeah. citizens because simply posting things on a website is not the preferred communication mechanism for this age group. And having phones that never get answered, phone calls that never get returned, surveys that get filled out to sign up, but then there's never a follow-up email. The communication system for older Virginians, the most vulnerable group in this pandemic, is utterly broken in Virginia, and I strongly urge the health department to reevaluate communication practices and address these deficiencies. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Catherine and I have discussed that. Uh, one more question before we need to address the public comment before we conclude while we still have a quorum. David, did you have something? I think David's next. He is. I'll be tremendously brief. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work everyone is doing under incredibly difficult circumstances. I want to acknowledge that. Um, two quick points. First, I want to acknowledge um, it is uh, very difficult. We keep hearing every day for um, home and community-based service workers, particularly those working under the consumer directed model who don't have a traditional employer to access the vaccine. Um, almost to the point where, where virtually none are getting vaccinated. So wanted to lift that up and how do we think about those who don't have a traditional um, uh, employer. The second point um, that I wanted to just note and we can come back to or have other conversations offline is there has been a lack at the national level under the previous administration of um, PSAs or other education work about the safety and the importance of the vaccine. I think it's incredibly important that we are communicating that and doing all that we can at the state and the local level here. And we'll love to talk more in the future about 
how do we do uh, vaccine education work with workforce and with older Virginians and their families? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for more Charlotte or do we need to get, move on with the, the uh, response about the public comment? I think, I think we could do maybe two more. I think Carla had her hand up at least in the Zoom at one okay. point. And then Deborah. Did, and, yeah. And Deborah. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, um, this is Carla. Carla, and yes, I did. Um, first of all, I'm on the long-term care task force, and I just want to commend you on the work that you do. I'm on the biweekly calls, and um, they, you've done a wonderful job. But I do share in the um, frustration with some of the other members here who have talked about, I have uh, been contacted by people whose family members who are in their 80s and 90s who are not in long-term care facilities, who are not, who, who have done everything possible and still not getting any kind of feedback. I know in Virginia Beach, where I am, the uh, our rollout was on Monday. The information, the website was. And I'm sorry to be so contrary, but the 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 website didn't work. It was late coming up from when they said it would work, and then once you were on it, it it wasn't intuitive at all. And I went back to our Human Rights Commission, to our and to our City Council to read to to give better instruction. Um, it, it does. It does feel as though, and especially for our older citizens, they're it, it's 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 not working. And so, not to continue to uh, be frustrated. When when is something going to be actually done, or when? I know you could take these concerns back. So, but when is there going to be an update or a better process for everybody? So, Charlotte, I can speak a little bit to that, if that's okay. And yeah. I'll be yeah. very, very quick. Um, so yesterday, the V4A met and Dr. Oliver was there. Many of these, uh, con these same frustrations and more were communicated to him. And um, he is going to try to um, come up with some solutions. Uh, he was made uh, very aware of all the issues. I would suggest that if we have some people meeting after this meeting to discuss this, that maybe we put together a letter to Dr. Oliver communicating um, the con many concerns from the many different perspectives and, and you know, asking just for what Carla just asked for. We need solutions and solutions quickly because people are dying every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, I'd like Thank to make you. a motion at this point because I'm afraid we're gonna run hey, out of time. Um, along with along Deborah's suggestion, could we draft a letter that would be signed, that you would sign on behalf of the uh, council that sort of expresses these concerns that we have sort of summarized here um, and forward that to the um, appropriate person at the health department um, or the governor's office or wherever it needs to be appropriately sent. Okay, thank you, Carter. Uh, is this an, a, an motion or what? It is a motion. I'd... Okay. Is there a this second? is Roland, I second. Any additional discussion before we run over time? I think we can incorporate the co public comments that we were going to address for, uh, from Mr. Martin, and, and that could be incorporated in this as well. If there's not any further discussion, you want to call Mar uh, the roll, Charlotte? Sure, I can do that. Um, okay, so this is a motion to send a letter to the appropriate decision makers regarding some of the items and concerns that were discussed here today by the council. Yes. Uh, okay, David Broder. Aye. Harvey. Aye. Uh, Jennifer, I think, had to leave. Amy. Aye. Um, Joni. Aye. Carter. Aye. Diana. Aye. Debbie. Aye. Catherine? Aye. Tina? Aye. Beverly? Yes. Aye. Michael? Aye. Jay? I think Jay had to jump off. Roland? Aye. And Erica? Aye. Um, you still have a quorum, and so your vote and your vote was passed unanimously. Thank you. We will we will take care of the uh, drafting the letter and distribute it to the appropriate people. And I, I thank you all for this discussion. 
And I want to take a second to thank Charlotte for the work that she does for this um, council, because without her, we, we would not ever be able to accomplish what we have recently. Uh, so I would like to publicly thank her. Uh, and I think we, we should definitely thank Sarah and Monica for joining absolutely. us today. That, I know that information about the long-term care settings was uh, very interesting and helpful for me and certainly some stuff that I didn't know. And I feel like I've come away with a lot more awareness, particularly about how that's being handled and hope we can get some uh, more of a higher uptick in some of the staff in those settings. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get some of these issues ironed out soon in Virginia because it is very, as a person who is waiting for the vaccine, I can tell you my concern now is will there be enough vaccine for my second shot because I was one of the lucky ones who got one. So um, in, that, in that category that we've been talking about. Okay, so if there isn't, if, if we can close this particular discussion, we had a couple more. I, have we addressed everybody's concerns through this, the letter that will be drafted? Is there consensus around that, that we, we can conclude the discussion about this further? Yes. Okay, then, then let's go ahead and try to finish the meeting. Um, and if you want to stay later, we can do that. But right now, I just wanted to ask Charlotte if she could briefly give the, the announcements that she had planned to give. Sure. So you have received a handout that outlines some additional agency and division updates that weren't covered. Um, from the commissioner or deputy commissioner today. And I would encourage you to read through those. It also has information about aging related reports, additional details about COVID-19 updates that might be of interest. Um, and I tried to pull this together because I knew we might not have enough time to go into any detail, but if you read through that and you have any questions, please let us know. I hope you will take time to at least kind of peruse it. There's a lot in there that I try to capture things that I know are of interest to members and you all have sometimes such very varied interests. So I'm trying to make sure that what your type of information you're looking for is being um, pulled together and delivered to you, knowing that we can't meet as long as we had would usually be doing in an in-person setting. Is, um is there any other business that we need to? I just wanted to, um, Beverly, one, there is also a handout with your regulatory update in it. Um, and you will see some activities that have been in underway from a regulatory perspective in aging and for older adults and caregiving and then our sister agencies. So um, please also take a look at that. And I encourage you to explore those um, chain, regulatory changes which as a reminder, have the force of law, much like the legislation that Eric has discusses and that the General Assembly considers um, during this time. Uh, is there any unfinished business before we officially adjourn? I do not have anything else. Any, anything from any of the other members? Well, if, uh, if we Mrs. Mrs. Rowland, motion to adjourn. Okay. We don't need a motion. We don't need we, one, but I would like to finish the agenda. We, we can. Yeah, we, we'll just, without any further items on the agenda, I will now adjourn the meeting and thank you for your participation today and for the discussion that we've held. And the next meeting is scheduled for April 28th and you will receive information on that at a later date. So with that given, given that, um, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Elizabeth, you can stop the stream and the recording.